Today we turn to another very critical issue, and that is chem chemical weapons and how or whether uh, they can actually be controlled. Uh, to discuss this, we're really very fortunate to have Professor Knopf with us. He is Professor and Program Chair of Nonproliferation and Terrorism Studies at the Middlebury Institute. And he is also a specialist at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. Uh, when Jeff Knopf was a college student in the late uh, 70s and early 80s, he participated in protest movements uh, against the nuclear arms race. And this piqued a lifelong interest in understanding the risks associated with nuclear weapons and the options for states to reduce those risks and what ordinary citizens can do uh, to contribute to lessening nuclear dangers. After graduation, he worked uh, for two years at nonprofit organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations in Washington, D.C., uh, who were involved with arms control. And uh, then he decided to get his PhD in order to study these issues in greater depth and this launched him into an academic career. Uh, since completing his PhD at Stanford in political science, uh, he has taught at the University of Southern California, at the Naval Postgraduate School, at the University of California at Santa Cruz, and at the Middlebury Institute uh, of International Studies here in Monterey. So today he's going to talk about his recent work on the use of chemical weapons in Syria. And the title of his presentation is How to Stop a Dictator from Using Chemical Weapons, um, Lessons from the United States Response to Syria. I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn and Judy uh, and Larry, for um, inviting me. Um, I want to take about five seconds just to acknowledge the fact that today is Martin Luther King Day. Um, uh, he has nothing to do with my talk, but he was a great uh, American, and uh, it's an honor to be uh, invited to speak on the day that we uh, dedicate to uh, celebrating his legacy. Um, as Judy mentioned, I have spent most of my um, adult life uh, working one way or another on issues related to nuclear weapons. Uh, and um, as I think probably everybody in this room will know, sometimes uh, nuclear weapons are grouped together with biological and chemical weapons and all called weapons of mass destruction, which is very misleading because nuclear weapons are much more uh, destructive than the other two. Um, but very fortunately, nuclear weapons um, have not been used since the end of World War II, and so I've spent most of my career um, hopefully trying to contribute to avoiding a very bad outcome that hasn't happened. <coughs> Uh, but at a certain point in time, I realized, well, maybe it was time to spend a little time thinking about one of the weapons in the WMD category that has unfortunately been used, which is chemical weapons. So I have um, stepped a very tiny amount outside my comfort zone to look at the, the chemical weapons issue in Syria. Um, as, uh, if you can see the slides here, um, this is a, a project that I'm doing with two colleagues, Wynne Bowen. Uh, and Matthew Moran, who are both based at King's College in London. So I just want to acknowledge um, that I'm speaking on behalf of all three of us. They've contributed uh, to the work we're doing. Um, I'll periodically say we. Um, that's not the royal we. That's just me referring to the fact that these are sort of uh, shared conclusions between myself and my two co-authors. My answer this works. Um, I got a bunch of slides. Uh, I will try to move through expeditiously. Most of them don't have a ton of, of content on them, and I, I do want to leave a lot of time for Q&A. Um, I'm not going to get too much into um, uh, the evidence uh, about uh, what happened inside Syria or why Syria is doing what it's doing. Uh, the focus of our research has really been on the response of the outside world uh, and why it's been so very, very hard for outside powers, including the United States, uh, to find an, an effective response to what's been happening. Right. Um, I promise you this is the only slide with grim and grisly pictures, but I, words can't convey what a photo can, so I wanted to, us to have um, some visual that conveys what's been going on here. Um, so Syria in 2011-2012 uh, broke apart into what's been an exceptionally uh, brutal and nasty civil war. Um, 
as one uh, really small piece of the suffering in Syria, uh, chemical weapons have been used. And um, uh, even though the world has been struggling for more than 100 years, uh, to create a sense that the use of chemical weapons should be taboo, um, this taboo has been violated over and over and over and over and over again uh, in Syria. Um, there's a bunch of different estimates out there about how many times uh, chemical weapons have been used. Uh, it's hard to get really reliable data. Um, one uh, study that my co-authors and I have been very impressed by came out uh, about a year ago by a think tank based in Berlin called the German uh, Public Policy Institute. Uh, they um, look for pretty serious um, evidence to corroborate uh, reports of chemical attacks. Um, they have a relatively high-end estimate among the groups that have estimated what's going on. Uh, they believe that there may have been upwards of 350 incidents over the course of the uh, Syrian civil war involving chemical weapons. Um, some of these have definitely been carried out by non-state uh, terrorist groups. For example, uh, there were some attacks using sulfur mustard gas, the old World War I agent, uh, that have been very persuasively uh, attributed to ISIS uh, in the parts of Syria that they controlled. Uh, most of the chemical attacks, uh, GPPI estimates 98% of all the attacks, uh, have been carried out by government forces uh, that are loyal to uh, the President Bashar uh, al-Assad. Uh, and this includes the handful of, of attacks that really um, captured world headlines because they produced mass casualties. So uh, upper left and right hand uh, photos, um, those are both from um, uh, an attack on uh, Ghouta, uh, which is a sort of outer suburban district around uh, the capital city, Damascus. Uh, this took place in August uh, 2013. Uh, it involved the nerve agent uh, sarin, uh, and it's estimated that it killed about 1,400 people, including about 400 uh, children. Um, lower left photo there is from the most recent um, reported uh, attack that produced mass casualties. This took place in Duma, which is a town um, in the Ghouta region. Uh, this used uh, chlorine, uh, and it's estimated it killed about 40 to 50 people. This was in April of 2018. <clears throat> okay, no more nasty photos after this. I just wanted to kind of put the reality out there. So that's the problem. Chemical weapons are getting used. Uh, the world wants them to be taboo. We don't like it. Um, if you're the United States, though, and you have to come up with a policy to do something about this, um, you're immediately caught on a pretty nasty policy dilemma. So on the one hand, um, there's really nobody who is enthusiastic to go to war over this issue. Um, this is happening after the United States has been involved in the Middle East for a decade, uh, first in Afghanistan, then in Iraq, then in Libya. And by the time this issue pops up in about 2012 or so, there is literally nobody who's advocating a full-scale military intervention to do something about Syria. There's just too much war weariness. We don't want to get involved in another uh, Middle Eastern conflict. Uh, in addition, there's a real fear that if you push on Assad too hard uh, and he falls suddenly and catastrophically, uh, the people who are going to take over in this power vacuum are going to be jihadist groups, uh, which have been very active amongst the opposition uh, in the Syrian civil war. So don't want to use all the military force about this. On the other hand, um, nobody feels very comfortable just doing nothing. Right, you have this massive, flagrant violation of a norm that people attach a lot of value to. Uh, plus, Syria, um, by the time the Civil War breaks out, Syria had built up a really large stockpile of chemical weapons stored in a bunch of sites around the country. Uh, and there's this fear that as uh, Islamist groups capture territory, uh, they're going to capture some of the chemical stockpiles and gain possession of these chemical weapons. So this doesn't seem like an issue that you can just leave alone uh, and do nothing. Um, so if on the one hand, you don't want to go to war. On the other hand, you don't want to do nothing. Is there an option in between these two? Uh, and yes, there is. This option is a strategy that, um, for shorthand, we call coercion. Now, believe it or not, um, this is a technical term of art amongst academics who study uh, international relations and not just an everyday word that you use in, in your uh, ordinary speech. Um, and the best uh, definition of it comes from a very influential um, writer, uh, academic writer about international relations, the late uh, Tom Schelling, um, who said we can make a distinction between brute force on the one hand and coercion on the other hand. Right? 
brute force is when you go in, all-out military, completely defeat the other side, leave them no choice about the outcome, force them to surrender, impose your will on them. U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. Okay. Coercion is where you don't go in with guns blazing, but what you do is you threaten to do that, right? You, you make a conditional threat. If you do X, I can do Y using my military, and Y will be something that you don't like. Right? And the goal of this is not to use force, but use only a very little bit of it, uh, but to do this to influence the decision making of the other side. So they stay in power, they have a choice over the outcome, uh, but uh, we, the coercer, uh, tries to essentially shape and manipulate their costs and benefits uh, to steer them into the path of action that we want and away from the path of action that we don't want. Um, Schelling also introduced another very useful distinction between deterrence, which is kind of an old term that I think we're all, all familiar with, uh, and a second version of uh, coercion that he called compellence. Uh, and the key difference is that the deterrence tries to prevent something which uh, the other side might be thinking of, but which hasn't happened yet. Um, don't use chemical weapons in an attack. Uh, compellence tries to force somebody to stop doing something they're already doing or start doing something now that they're not doing. Um, sign the Chemical Weapons Convention and give up your chemical weapon. So one of the things that's really interesting about Syria from just wearing my kind of academic hat here is that it's a case that involves both versions of coercion. There's both deterrence uh, and compellence going on. Uh, and compellence uh, takes a form of compellence that, that academics call coercive diplomacy. Uh, the threat to maybe do something militarily unless the other side does something we want them to use, uh, we want them to do. Okay, so here's what we've been um, trying to figure out in our, in our research. Um, we look at both the experiences of the Obama administration and the Trump administration, uh, and we take this one uh, historical sequence and when we treat it as a case study that has sort of three phases to it. So the first phase is um, uh, from the start of the Civil War through that Ghouta attack, which was the largest chemical attack of the Civil War, uh, and is basically a, a big time failure for deterrence. Uh, the second phase is what happened right afterwards when very unexpectedly uh, Syria was pressured into actually signing the Chemical Weapons Convention. This is the treaty that outlaws chemical weapons. They were not previously a member of it. Uh, and being told they had to declare all their chemical uh, agents and allow them to be removed and destroyed, uh, removed from the country and destroyed. Um, this is a pretty uh, unexpected success. Um, as people in this room will probably know it wasn't 100% success. Syria was able to eventually resume use of chemical weapons, but it was still a big deal. Um, uh, and then we, uh, third phase of the case is basically the Trump years where you have two more mass casualty uh, attacks that are two more deterrence failures. Uh, and basically what we want to do is sort of figure out why this mixed track record, why a lot of failure, but at least a moment of success, uh, is it possible to figure out what's going on uh, that accounts for these varying outcomes uh, and to the extent that we can figure out what's going on, uh, does this teach us any policy lessons? Does this help us figure out uh, what we might have been able to do different uh, that would have gone a little bit better? Um, so we're academics, so we have a theory, <laughs> um, which I'm going to do like super quick and dirty, because I know this isn't a room full of theorists. Um, there's a lot of research on both deterrence um, and coercive diplomacy. A little bit ironically, because they're both forms of coercion, they tend to run on somewhat separate tracks, different people doing the research. Uh, but because both types of coercion have been used in this case, um, we look at both of the existing research literatures. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so we just said, um, what are some factors that get talked a lot about in one or both of these uh, literatures um, that might be helpful for us thinking about this case? And so we picked some pretty obvious ones, and we've got sort of three factors, three variables that make up our analytical framework. Um, credibility, to what extent were US threats, uh, things that could be deemed credible or not. Um, motivations, or the balance of motivations, basically who cared more. Um, and I'm going to tell you the bottom line right here, it's not going to surprise you, Syria cared more. That's the main problem. Uh, and then what's called assurance, which is a, a little bit of a subtle thing, and I'll explain that in a, in a moment, but let me just run through each of these real quick. Um, so credibility is probably what people think about first and hear about first whenever you're talking about deterrence of are our threats credible or not. Um, uh, you may not be aware of this, but, but whether credibility really matters or not and how much is actually an incredibly contested, controversial issue in the scholarly literature. Um, and we're trying really hard not to get sucked into the black hole of that particular debate. Um, 
So we're looking to kind of steer a middle ground here in which we acknowledge that credibility might be important, um, but it's not necessarily going to be the only thing that matters, uh, and it's not necessarily going to be decisive. So it may turn out, for example, uh, that a country like the United States can do everything that is prescribed you know, to create a threat that should be highly credible, and it still fails. Right? Maybe the credibility is not by itself so important that it's sort of the secret sauce that makes everything work. Um, it's very easy to reason backwards here. Oh, this threat failed, therefore it must not have been credible. Um, but that's reasoning from a known outcome to a conclusion that's not legitimate. Um, so what we wanted to do was figure out are there some objective criteria for assessing credibility. And the, the ones that are most frequently used among academic um, international relations specialists were uh, developed by a scholar named Ned, Ned Lebeau. And it's just a checklist for four ingredients. Um, did a state formulate a commitment? Um, you can't deter something if you haven't decided to deter it in the first place. Um, did you communicate it? Does the other side know that you care about it? Uh, do you have the capabilities to back it up? Uh, and do you have the will and the resolve to back it up? Uh, and almost all of the debates about credibility are on this fourth one about resolve. Um, how do you actually establish resolve? How important is it? And again, we didn't want to take sides in this debate, so we come in sort of agnostic. We just list uh, all the factors that get a lot of support in the literature. So one is that you have a reputation because you were tough in the past, so maybe you'll be tough in the future. Um, a second one is essentially kind of commitment tactics that you can take in the present, something which in the flow of a crisis uh, shows that you care. Um, one that's going to be very important in the Syria case is um, creating what are called domestic audience costs. So a leader going public with their commitment, because then if they back down, everybody can see that this was a public commitment, uh, and especially in a democratic country, you expect uh, democratic constituents, domestic constituents, to hold the leader accountable for not uh, fulfilling their pledges. Uh, and then people who are really skeptical of um, the first two uh, basically argue, you know, you can't actually bluff here. Either you have real national interests on the line, in which case you're believable, or you don't, in which case nothing you can do is going to change it. And we'll just look at all three of these as we, as we walk through the case. Okay, um, so credibility is the first factor. Motivations is the second factor we look at. Um, often scholars who study international relations treat states as a kind of a, a, a black box or a billiard ball. You're, um, uh, treated as if you are a unitary actor making rational calculations about your national interest in the outside world. Um, that's not going to work for Syria because Syria is in the middle of a civil war. So we need to kind of open the black box, uh, look at domestic politics inside Syria, and realize that the motivation that matters here uh, is regime survival. Right? If you are Bashar al-Assad and his inner circle, and you're looking around the Middle East in the early 2010s, um, you may remember that there was a certain character named Saddam Hussein, uh, and when he um, was removed from power, um, he and his children were executed. Um, there was this other character named Colonel Gaddafi, uh, when he lost his domestic power struggle, um, he was executed. Um, so the stakes are kind of high, right? You lose this civil war, you're probably dead. Okay, so serious motivations, regime survival, very, very, very high motivation level. That's going to run through the whole case here. Okay, assurance is maybe the one term here that's not going to be obvious. This is actually another really cool Thomas Schelling insight. Um, he has a great uh, quote that people quote all the time in one of his books. Uh, if you warn somebody, uh, take one more step and I shoot, implicitly you had better be promising them that if they don't take that step, you're not going to pull the trigger. <laughs> that's called assurance. If they expect you to shoot no matter what, their best play is just run at you as fast as possible and try to get that gun out of your hand. They're going to take that step and a whole lot more. Okay, so if you have a very credible threat, but you don't have a credible assurance, if somebody thinks you're after them coming to get them no matter what, they're still not going to be deterred. They're still not going to be compelled. Um, Syria ends up being a real interesting case. One of the, the conclusions that, that we're playing with um, is that you know, ever since Schelling, we've just tended to assume that this is a yes-no. Um, either you've provided assurance, in which case you set up your threat the right way and it should work, uh, or you have not, in which case your threat is going to fail. Um, we think that the Obama and, and Trump administrations actually kind of missed to, in two different directions. This may be more of a Goldilocks thing, where there's sort of a, a middle ground that makes sense. Uh, President Obama, as I'll, I'll turn to in a minute, uh, from very early on, 
uh, pledged that he wanted Assad gone, i.e. U.S. policy is regime change. We want to get Assad out. Use chemical weapons, don't use chemical weapons. We're still trying to push you out. Okay, that kind of fails the assurance side. Right, we're coming after Assad no matter what he does. Um, president Trump probably under, uh, sorry, probably oversupplied assurances. When, when Donald Trump becomes president, he basically says, I don't care what's happening in Syria. Um, we have no interest in removing Assad from power. Um, now that's too much assurance. He can go ahead and do whatever he wants, including using chemical weapons, thinking that Trump's not going to care. So we learned a little interesting thing about assurance here. Um, I'll hold the thought about Russia until we, until we get into the case. So, was there a way to stop a dictator from using chemical weapons? Maybe. Um, the more time we spend on this case, the less optimistic I get about our policy recommendation. Um, I would say if there was anything that had a fighting chance, that the closest we were going to get to a possibility uh, was what's up here on the slide. Um, uh, people um, in the military often talk about uh, deterrent strategies as being um, you have to figure out what to hold at risk on the other side. So the leverage here was going to come from what Assad cared about. What he cared about was regime survival. So for, to be effective, a threat probably had to put that front and center. If you use chemical weapons, that might be the one and only thing that would get us to decide that you're just too bad a bad guy. And despite all our reluctance to intervene, uh, we're going to come try to do something that would force you out of power. But if it's clear that you're not going to use chemical weapons, we'll leave you alone and let you stay in power. So if you behave badly, we try to increase the risk to regime survival. If you behave well, specifically in the chemical domain, we pull back and we don't do that. Now, this doesn't have to be uh, Iraq 2.0. Right, so this is not necessarily a threat to actually invade, uh, boots on the ground, overthrow the regime of military force. It could be a threat to do things that just increase the risk to Assad. So for example, we'll really increase uh, the scale and lethality of the military aid that we provide to opposition groups who are, who are fighting to overthrow you. Or we will launch a bombing campaign that selectively knocks out certain targets that are really important to your ability to stay in power. We'll knock out um, all of your intelligence assets that tell you what the opposition is up to. Uh, we'll knock out your air force so you can't bomb anymore. Um, so things that would just change the balance on the ground in Syria without necessarily requiring US boots on the ground. Now, in theory, this sounds really great. Um, in practice, nobody went within 100 miles of this uh, because it had some really serious practical problems. On the one hand, People are actually kind of afraid of knocking Assad out of power because they're not sure who's going to take over if and when he falls. So nobody wants to push on this door too, too hard. Um, on the other hand, um, even though I think probably everybody in the room would say, oh, using chemical weapons is evil, it's immoral, um, when you actually try to frame your coercive threat in this way, you immediately run into a big moral humanitarian dilemma. The message that you're giving is basically, kill people however you want, barrel bombs, you know, conventional force, um, capture them and torture them. You can do whatever you want as long as you're not using chemical weapons. That's the only thing we care about. Um, it's really hard for any Western leader to say that out loud. Right? It, just, it, it sends a very troubling uh, humanitarian message. So um, this was never considered. We found no evidence that, that this option ever came up for debate. Um, no leader came within 100 miles of it. But they wanted to deter. They wanted to stop uh, Assad from using chemical weapons. Um, so we argue that what they did is they kind of fell back on the familiar. There's kind of a script for how we do deterrence. It's how we always do it. Um, talk really tough. Act really tough. Show your, try to show that you're willing to act. Uh, and threaten to drop a bunch of bombs. Well, we'll just launch a lot of cruise missiles at you. If you misbehave, we'll, we'll use air power. We'll launch some airstrikes at you. So we get a little bit snarky here. Uh, we've labeled this the resolve plus bombs formula. If you just show your resolve and threaten to drop some bombs, surely they'll do what we want, because that's how we always do it. Mm. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. And we will now show you why. OK, so let's do the first phase of the case. So civil war uh, through the Kuta uh, nerve agent attack. Um, so civil war breaks out as a kind of spillover from the Arab Spring. Uh, it starts as peaceful protests in Damascus in spring 2011. Uh, Assad's having none of it because he's already seen what's happened elsewhere in the Arab world. 
uh, immediately moves to uh, violent uh, suppression of dissent. Uh, and so the opposition goes from nonviolent to violent, uh, and every uh, jihadist and their cousin in the world uh, starts rushing into Syria to join the fight. By summer of 2012, uh, U.S. intelligence starts to get reports of uh, chemical agents possibly being prepared to be moved or to be used. Uh, the nerve agents in Syria are what are, what are called binary. There's two uh, chemical precursor chemicals that aren't deadly by themselves, but when you mix them together, they form the nerve gas, so that's the intelligence they're getting. Um, first uh, attack that was later corroborated uh, took place in December 2012, and then a bunch more as 2013 got started. Um, in spring of 2013, the Syrian government actually got quite cheeky and, and uh, started to play their own kind of counter strategy here. Um, they're claiming it's not them, that it's actually the rebel groups that are doing this, and so they invite the UN to come in and investigate what was almost certainly an attack that they themselves uh, carried out. So, um, uh, I don't know what the Arab word is for chutzpah, but whatever it is, uh, so it's got plenty of it. Um, okay. So President Obama immediately uh, boxes himself into a corner. Uh, very early on in the Civil War, he makes a statement uh, all the way back in August 2011, the time has come for President Assad to step aside. Um, and he's joined by a number of other Western powers in this, uh, and never wavers from this through the rest of Obama's time in office, uh, US policies that Assad should go. Then we get to uh, summer 2012, and um, Chuck Todd, a reporter a lot of you may know, um, is at a press conference where President Obama is there, and he asks him a question. Um, how do you feel about the safety and security of the chemical weapons that are in Syria? And, and apparently, spontaneously, and without this being pre-cleared by his staff or his advisors, uh, President Obama says, a red line for us uh, is we start seeing a whole bunch of CW moving around or being utilized. That would change my calculus. That would change my... Uh, equation and, and a follow-up question from uh, Chuck Todd, well, what would you do? He says, well, there would be quote-unquote enormous consequences for this. So this is the beginning of the U.S. deterrent posture. Right? It's a red line, you use chemical weapons, uh, we'll have to do something, and we won't say what it was, but it will be enormous consequences. Now it's like maybe dropping some bombs, right? It's all plus bombs. Okay, how's it go? Um, after Ghouta happened, everyone just assumed that the problem was that this threat wasn't credible. But that's probably not true. There was probably a lot that should have made Obama quite credible. Uh, if you think that you develop a reputation based on what you did in the past, think about what President Obama had already done by then. Um, he had approved a surge of troops into Afghanistan. He had increased the use of drone strikes to go after terrorists. Uh, he had joined with NATO to intervene in Libya. He would approved the raid that got Osama bin Laden. So he campaigned as an anti-war president, but he governed as a president who had absolutely no reservations about ordering uh, the use of force if he thought it was in the US national interest to do so. Um, plus, by making this red line comment in public, he put his own reputation on the line. He created big time uh, domestic audience costs. So if you're an academic looking for an objective way to code whether threats are credible or not, this checks every item on the list. Right? This should have been a credible threat. Um, on the other hand, maybe not. Uh, there's no obvious intrinsic interest at stake for the United States. This is about extending a deterrent threat to protect civilians inside another country that's not even a U.S. ally. That's not uh, something which has high intrinsic value for the U.S. Um, and rather than the issue here being resolve and a willingness to take action, the biggest problem around the red line is actually a communication issue. Where exactly is this red line drawn? What is a whole bunch? Right? What, what triggers the threat being implemented? And here we get into a problem, a, a very tragic problem, I have to say, with the norm. The norm's absolute. You use a chemical as a weapon, it's, it's illegal. Right? It's bad, it's taboo. In practice, there's a whole range of variation that's possible. Right. Something like sarin is a nerve agent, it's pretty sophisticated, it was formulated and, and invented to be a weapon, it always kills a lot of people. Something like chlorine can be used as a chemical weapon. Um, you know, you put it in your swimming pool. It's not illegal to have it, it's not, not a, a substance that's banned under the Chemical Weapons Convention. And it may kill a lot less people. So if you use chlorine and nobody dies, you have violated the taboo, um, but is this worth dropping bombs over? 
Okay. Well, nobody wants to say that the, the, the red line only applies to certain kinds of chemical weapons use and not others, so it's never articulated clearly, and hence there's always an ambiguity about where exactly is this red line drawn. Okay. The other problem here is that, you know what, there's not really a whole lot of domestic audience costs. Um, there's public opinion polling through this whole period, and no matter what, at least 80% of the public doesn't want to touch Syria with a 100-foot pole. Right? There's enormous war weariness at this point in the U.S. public, um, and uh, there's not going to be any price for Obama if he doesn't act, because nobody wants to get involved in Syria. Uh, and then finally, we have these past actions, you know, Afghanistan, uh, getting bin Laden, going into Libya, this looks like a tough guy. Um, Libya is an utter bleeping disaster, um, and by the time Syria is getting red hot, uh, the main thing that President Obama has concluded is, I made a big mistake going into Libya and I don't want to do this again. So it's not a past action that demonstrates toughness. It's an object lesson that increases Obama's uh, hesitancy in him uh, being the kind of president that he is. He uses about this a lot out loud, so everybody knows he's having uh, a lot of hesitation. Um, so on balance, the threat probably should have been credible, but there's factors going both ways, and one of the, the lessons we learned from this is that credibility may be actually quite hard to assess objectively. If you want to give a, a sort of positive answer to this first period, you might have gotten a measure of deterrence in the early phase, and then what basically happens is that Syria starts using chemical weapons, but for a long time they keep the chemical attacks really low level. Um, small use, not a lot of casualties, and it looks like what they're basically doing is they're estimating where the red line is. As long as we don't push too hard here, we can get away with some low-level attacks. But there's a measure of deterrence because they're deterred from escalating to high-level attacks. Um, then in August 2013, which by the way is a year to the day after President Obama's red line press conference, I don't think that's a coincidence, um, we have the attack on Ghouta, which is clearly way above the red line no matter how you uh, see it. Um, the main problem here is, is the balance of motivations. Um, by this point in time, uh, Syria has been in civil war for about two years. It's a stalemate. Um, Assad's not losing and about to be overthrown, but he's not winning. Uh, and in particular, um, in this part of the world, you have to be really, really concerned about keeping control of the capital city. Uh, and the rebels are advancing on Damascus. And if Damascus falls, it's all over. Um, so they need to break the stalemate uh, in the fighting, and the way they do that is to escalate the use of chemical weapons by hitting a rebel stronghold uh, and basically forcing them to clear out of that area. Um, so the, the problem was that, that Assad was just so motivated to use chemical weapons that in his calculus, you know, better to use chemical weapons and survive and stay in power and have the U.S. drop some bombs on me than not to use chemical weapons and be overthrown. So even if he thinks the threat's 100% credible, he's fully expecting the bombs to drop, it's still in his self-interest to use chemical weapons because the stakes are so high. Um, assurance probably hurt here because he knows Obama's gonna try to push him out whether he uses chemical weapons or not. Uh, and by this point in time, because there's no real response to the low-level uh, uses of chemical weapons, uh, Syria's been probing and it's gotten no response, the uh, credibility is probably also damaged at this point. So all three factors are sort of pointing to a deterrence failure, but motivation is probably most important. Okay, so if, that's, if this was all that had happened, the conventional wisdom, I think you could rescue it pretty well. Well, Obama let credibility erode, and look what happened. So after Ghouta, mm -hmm. the United States does not respond with military force. So if anything, credibility should still be going down. Um, but to some extent, a miracle occurs. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of talk. It's really obvious the red line's been violated. Obama's pissed off. He asks the military to draw up some target lists. Uh, the UK and France join in, and all three are going to strike um, Assad because of this. Uh, and then domestic politics in the West uh, rears its head, and it, it all goes off the rails. Uh, David Cameron, you may remember him, um, uh, Prime Minister of the UK, uh, decides to ask Parliament for a vote about whether or not the, the UK should use military force here. Uh, and in a sign of his exceptional uh, vote counting skills, which will be on display later with Brexit, um, he loses um, in the House of Parliament, and the UK is now out. It's down down to the US and France to do something. Uh, in the US, um, the, the British vote shakes the Americans, uh, along with a number of other factors, including the fact that President Obama used to be a constitutional lawyer. Uh, 
he decides that he too should go to Congress and get, try to get authorization from Congress to act. So uh, U.S. retaliation is still being planned, but it's now postponed uh, while the administration goes to Congress. Uh, and anybody uh, in the U.S. who knows how to count votes knows that this is not going to go well uh, for President Obama. So the whole threat to retaliate after Guta is falling to pieces, except in one place in the world, Moscow. All right, I told you the Russians were going to show up at some point. Here they are. Um, just so happens that while this debate is going on, there's a G20 summit scheduled. Uh, Obama and Putin uh, have a sideline conversation at the G20. Um, different accounts actually disagree about who proposed the idea, Obama or Putin. Some of them give credit to Obama, some to Putin. Um, but they have a conversation which basically goes, um, if the Russians could um, talk to their friend and buddy, uh, Assad, uh, convince him to actually give up his chemical weapons, would that be enough to get the U.S. to take the threat of airstrikes back off the table uh, and not hit the Syrians? And Obama says, sure, we'd, we'd be willing to check this out and see if we can make this work. Um, so a few days later, um, Secretary of State John Kerry is at a, at a press conference. Press conferences loom large in this uh, narrative. Uh, and he's asked a question, is there anything Syria can do to avoid U.S. retaliation? And Kerry, with the knowledge that these conversations are going on in the back of his head, but not really expecting them to go anywhere, uh, makes this off-the-cuff comment, well, sure. I mean, if Assad signed the Chemical Weapons Convention and let us take all the chemical weapons out of there, then we take our strikes off the table, but that's never going to happen. Within about two hours, he gets a phone call from Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov saying, hey, we like what you said at that press conference there. Let's do it. Um, super fast negotiations, and within about five days, there's a deal. Um, uh, the Russians essentially tell Syria, you have no choice, you're going to sign this piece of paper or else, uh, and they do. Um, uh, Syria agrees to enter the Chemical Weapons Convention, declare its chemical weapons and production facilities and allow everything to be destroyed. Okay. So, what happened here? The U.S. threat arguably became more credible not in our eyes, because we kind of know what happens when Obama's going to go to Congress, but you know, in Russia, the Duma doesn't matter very much. Putin's pretty much a dictator. Um, he doesn't really get the idea that what Congress says might actually make a difference to President Obama. He's like, hey, you're the boss. Do what you want. Right? And Putin assumes that sooner or later, Obama's going to order military action. If not now, after Ghouta, Syria will just use chemical weapons again and that the next time. The U.S. is going to absolutely just feel its hand is forced. We're going to have to use military force. Um, and the Russians have a particular perception of the U.S. I have to say, it's not flattery. Um, they basically view us as a bunch of screw-ups. Right? We go in, we claim this is going to be a really limited mission. Um, we're just going to you know, protect Benghazi from Gaddafi, uh, have a little no-fly zone and a safe haven. And the next thing you know, Gaddafi's dead, and ISIS is running around Libya, and the whole place is a mess. Right? And they remember Kosovo and when we went into Iraq and everywhere else. And they say, you know, the Americans, they, ha they have a pretty well-established track record of past actions. And it's saying you're going to keep things limited and they're not keeping their word because once they dip their toes in the water, they go all in. And they're going to end up going with what's starting out as a limited mission. And before you know it, they've overthrown Assad. Uh, and Syria is just going to be another place like Libya. So the Russians are so afraid of this happening that for them it's better to go to their ally Assad and say, give up the chemical weapons. You can still fight the civil war without them, but at least this way the Americans won't come in and knock you out of power. Um, okay, so that's credibility. Not so much credibility in Damascus, but credibility in Moscow, but it changes the equation. Um, in Damascus, the calculation is pretty simple. Um, Keep the chemical weapons, but Russia doesn't help me anymore. Have Russia committed publicly to my survival and give up the chemical weapons, which is going to help me win the Civil War more. And so, you know what? It's not a hard calculation. I want the Russians. Um, and it turns out to be the right calculation, because in September 2015, the Russians officially intervened militarily, and they're basically fighting the fight for Assad still right now, uh, bombing the um, uh, sea by, by P out of uh, Hitler province. Um, and assurance also it tilts a little bit more uh, in favor here, because now Assad knows that Russia's publicly got his back, so that pretty much guarantees his survival. And the one thing that could overthrow him from the US, which is the threat of military action, uh, is taken off the table. Okay. Um, 
My co-authors and I code this as largely successful. Um, about 1,300 tons of chemical agents were declared by Syria and removed uh, and destroyed. A lot of them actually on a U.S. A naval ship that was a very rapidly jerry-rigged with chemical uh, neutralization equipment. Uh, 27 production facilities are closed down, uh, but it's not 100% success, and we'll see in phase three that Syria does eventually return to chemical weapons use. Okay. So, um, fast forward a little bit, and we'll get into the Trump years. Um, the tweets actually predate when, when President Trump became tr uh, president. Um, at the time of the attack in Ghouta in 2013, uh, he was already busily sending out tweets, uh, basically saying, um, don't use military force in response to this chemical attack in Syria. It would be a very bad idea. So from very early on, uh, Donald Trump is publicly on record saying he does not believe the United States should get involved in Syria, even if they're using chemical weapons. So that's going to um, mess up the assurance side, uh, because now it's not contingent on what Syria does, right? Oh, we're going to let you stay in power no matter what you do. Have at it. Okay, probably too much. Um, that's consistent with his campaign in 2016, where the foreign policy is to get out of these endless forever wars uh, and to have a more non-interventionist U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and so Syria, again, does what it did after the red line, which is they probe. So right off the bat, uh, inaugural January 2017, Syria resumes uh, low-level chemical attacks, including a couple that use sarin, but without mass casualties. Nothing happens uh, in March. Uh, then UN Ambassador Nikki Haley goes public with a statement that our priority is not getting Assad uh, out of Syria. Uh, and by April 4th, they're like, woohoo, okay, we do what we want. Uh, so we have the next mass casualty uh, attack uh, in Khan Sheikhoun, uh, which is in the um, northwest uh, of Syria. Um, uh, uses sarin, uh, around 80 to 100 people killed. Um, this time, um, President Trump uh, doesn't mess with Congress, say, I don't care if this is constitutional or not, we're going to use some tomahawks here, uh, orders a um, cruise missile strike on the airfield from which the aircraft uh, were launched that carried out the chemical attack. Uh, right, and again, kind of classic resolve plus bombs. It's like, yeah, I'm a tough guy, and if you don't believe it, here's some cruise missiles for you. The target is fully symbolic. Um, doesn't change anything about Assad's military capabilities. They're flying planes from that airfield within a few days after the, the cruise missile strike. Okay. So what happened here? Um, one possibility, of course, is that Assad didn't understand that using chemical weapons might be the one thing that would get Trump to change his mind and, and use military force after all. Um, but we think that's probably not it. It's probably the same calculation they made uh, around Guto, which is um, we're um, getting our butts handed to us in this part of the country by the rebels. We need to change the course of the Civil War. Uh, and if President Trump does launch some cruise missiles at us in response, we can survive that, but we can't survive uh, losing the Civil War. Um, so the motivation, the regime's survival motivation is still key. Uh, and as I said, um, the fact that um, uh, Assad might have perceived a green light here because President Trump very clearly doesn't want to get involved in Syria and have made him feel he has a free hand. Okay. Well, surely launching some cruise missiles at Syria would have made the point, right? Different president. This is not Obama, not the guy who worries about constitutional law, a um, guy who likes to be tough and macho, uh, and he showed that he's willing to drop some bombs on us, so we better stop using chemical weapons. Doesn't work. Right. About a year later, uh, there's another attack, the Duma attack that I showed you on that early slide, uh, kills another 40 uh, to 70 uh, civilians, probably just using chlorine. Um, this time the U.S. actually gets back together with the U.K. and France, and the three countries jointly uh, launch airstrikes using about 105 uh, missiles, hitting three different targets. So if, if bombing one site with 60 weapons wasn't enough, let's hit three sites with 105, more resolve, more bombs, surely this will work this time. Um, the targets are at least somewhat more relevant, all three of them had some relationship to the chemical weapons program, um, but to the, to the nerve agent part of the program, not to the chlorine part of the program, it was a chlorine weapon uh, that had been used in Duma. Okay. Um, so why uh, the Duma strike, why this last deterrence failure? Um, <coughs> Credibility is not the key factor here. The U.S. should have been credible at this point. Trump used force, uh, and there's a lot of public statements by administration officials that want Syria to get out of the chemical weapons game. 
Um, so again, this is mostly motivations. So regime survival is still at risk, um, uh, and uh, assurance is still ratcheted up too high. There's too little willingness of the U.S. to do anything. Okay, so what's happened since the Duma attack? It looked like maybe deterrence had finally been established with the second round of airstrikes. Uh, more than a year went by with no new chemical attacks. There was finally one uh, reported chemical attack in uh, May 2019 uh, with just a few casualties. Um, but our interpretation is somewhat different. Uh, we think that if uh, the Assad regime was ever put in a situation where it felt like it needed chemicals to alter the flow of the civil war, it would still use them. Uh, and that what's really going on here is basically that Assad's winning. He's on the brink of victory. Uh, Russia's fully involved. Uh, the resistance has crumbled to just a few pockets in Idlib province. Uh, so there's really no need to use chemical weapons anymore to win the Civil War. Um, so we don't think the deterrence was really reestablished. OK, last couple slides. Um, so what comes out of this case? Of the three factors we put up at the beginning, credibility, motivations, and assurances, all three of them make a difference in this case, but motivations is clearly driving the train here. Uh, if the other side is really highly motivated to do something, even a very credible threat from the coercer can fail. Okay. Um, assurances were also important, but not quite in the way the literature has assumed. It's not so much of an on-off switch, but more of a Goldilocks thing where you can both undersupply and oversupply. Uh, assurances. Um, communication mattered a whole lot. The red line was just always ambiguous and that was that was an insoluble problem. Okay, so policy recommendations. Um, coercion is hard. Right? We should not assume that coercive threats are always going to work and always going to be effective. So if you can do an analysis ahead of time and you can see that coercion is going to be really challenging, look for some alternatives because maybe coercion is not your best bet. Um, if you are going to think about a coercive strategy, be careful not to get wrapped around the axle of, of credibility. Uh, U.S. foreign policy in particular, we seem to be really prone to obsess about our credibility all the time. If you do this, it will damage our credibility. If you do that, it will damage the credibility. We do think credibility matters, um, but it's not always the single most important factor. And so in particular, if somebody was to be a a uh, policy analyst or a military uh, planner or an advisor to the president in any way, trying to figure out how to make deterrence or, or coercive diplomacy effective, they should not be looking only at credibility, they should be looking at other things as well, like for example, what's actually motivating the other side. Um, this gets to a uh, element of US strategy in recent years called tailored deterrence. Um, rather than a one-size-fits-all approach, here's some bombs for you. Uh, think about how to tailor deterrent threats to address what the other side really cares about. Um, this may not matter for the very high-level threats, the nuclear stuff that I've cut my teeth on for most of my career. If North Korea launches a nuclear weapon at us, um, I hope that they expect us to launch some nukes back at them. There's not necessarily a whole lot of tailoring that has to happen there. But if you're dealing with something that's more of a humanitarian situation, enforcing a norm like norms against chemical weapons, uh, tailoring around the other side's motivations are likely to be really, really important. Uh, and then one slightly more optimistic conclusion, which is for all the problems for making coercive strategies, coercive threats effective, Syria shows that they can still sometimes be made to work. Uh, the threats, the pressure on Syria did get them to come into the Chemical Weapons Convention and, and allow quite a large percentage of their chemical weapons uh, to be removed. So this isn't, uh, we're not arguing to take this tool off the table completely, just use it with uh, caution and appreciation for its limits. Okay, um, that's it. I'm very happy to take uh, questions for the time we have left. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your insightful account and uh, for unraveling that complicated history for us. We have a roving mic and I will try to rove. <laughs> um, I remember when um, Obama was interviewed by The Atlantic magazine, he explained that the reason he did not mm -hmm. bomb Syria mm -hmm. was because he was afraid to set off uh, more chemical reaction by bombing the chemical facilities. Now, but however, you also then said, during the Trump administration, the US and UK and France bombed their chemical labs, but that did not set off anything, right? <laughs> so, uh, 
what is the danger of setting off chemical reaction if you bomb their chemical facilities? Yep, great question, Maria. Um, and I'm not the scientific expert here, so my answer will, per will be perhaps not complete. Um, under both uh, Obama and Trump, um, from the beginning, they were very clear that they were not going to target any of the storage depots where the chemical munitions themselves were stored. So they're not on the target list for the um, planning after Ghouta. Uh, and the facilities that Trump uh, struck, none of them actually were facilities where chemical weapons were stored. So one was a research lab. Um, one was, I think, a uh, scientific headquarters where the scientists worked. I can't remember. I'm blanking what the third one was now. Uh, but they knew there were not chemicals present on this site. So the danger is um, that if the, the airstrike doesn't completely incinerate the chemicals or release chemicals into the immediate environment and harm the civilians who are around uh, that area. So for both Obama and Trump, um, they were not going to hit actual uh, chemical storage sites. Um, you've taken the point of view of, I'm over here. <laughs> if you need sight. Um, <laughs> You've taken the point of view of outsiders looking at, at this. Why does a regime decide to poison its own people and bear, I mean, other than terrify them, uh, why, why is this the strategy instead of using the secret police or eliminating a neighborhood militarily? There's a couple things going on here. So one is just the, the, the nature of the people involved. Um, they uh, do not have the moral inhibitions about what they do to their own people that we would expect most leaders around the world to have. Um, uh, the Assad regime is just willing to be uh, savage on a scale that's sort of hard for people like us to wrap our minds around. Um, so that means that I, nothing's off the table. Right? They're willing to do anything they have to do to subdue the population and, and stay in power. Um, so this is partly a question of strategy. Um, you'll have heard the phrase hearts and minds, um, which is one strategy for counterinsurgency. Let's uh, win the hearts and minds of the population that, that insurgents uh, operate within so that they don't support the insurgents and they support the government. Um, that's not the strategy in Syria. Right? The, the strategy in Syria is essentially um, punish and terrify the civilian population as much as possible, so we'll be deathly afraid to allow the insurgents to come to their town because they're going to get punished if they do. Okay. Um, if they could have done all of that just with conventional forces, I think they would. Um, escalating to, to use of chemical weapons was risky for them. Uh, the problem they face is essentially a resources problem. Um, the Assad regime uh, his base of support is the um, Alawites, which are a sect of the Shiite branch uh, of Islam, uh, which is a minority of the population in Syria. Uh, the majority of support for uh, the rebellion against Assad, although not exclusively, uh, comes from the Sunni uh, population in Syria, which is a majority. Um, so eventually you run into a manpower problem that you just don't have enough troops you can call up who are loyal to the regime to match all the people who will uh, support the opposition. Um, plus, you only had a certain number of weapons at the start of the war, and as you're using up your conventional weapons um, and you're running down the stocks, um, you have to think about turning to other weapons. So it's partly just like what's still left in the warehouse. Oh, we have all these chemicals, we may as well use them. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, considering the fact that um, Assad's father, uh, how has Assad had a close relationship with Russia? When uh, President Obama spoke to Putin and asked him to mediate, uh, did, did, did he also think that they are going to be there for their after the rest of this uh, thing when it's mm -hmm. over? Mm -hmm. And did U.S. take that into account or not? And it seems like after the involvement of Russia, you see how much mm -hmm. uh, bloodshed had, it has increased. Also. Uh, the government of U.S. had another option, or possible option, the Iranian Goods Force, mm -hmm. with the leadership of Qasem Soleimani, mm -hmm. at 2011, when the uh, uprising started, right away they were there. 
and actually they were that they were the important supporter of the regime. And why didn't uh, U.S. government consider warning Iran? Because that also started interference of other countries like Saudi Arabia and and also because this this was a Shia force started the start of the uh, ISIS. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean these are all questions for me. Why did why was the U.S. so inactive and was it so much in a rush to get out of the Middle East? That's a lot of questions in one question. Um, there were um, warnings conveyed um, uh, to the Russians and the Iranians along with the Syrians, although mostly they were warnings to, um, we know you guys are buddies with Assad, please pass on our message to Assad not to use chemical weapons. Um, Hezbollah also got involved in support of Assad very early on. Um, I think the calculus uh, in President Obama's mind by 2012, 2013, uh, is that um, he's looking for the exit ramps. Right? The, the um, US military interventions in the Middle East, none of them are great successes, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya. Uh, and so I think his lessons, his worldview at that point in time is there's not much more benefit uh, that can be gained from U.S. involvement. Um, so he's he's too, I mean, because he's Obama, and he's 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 complex and, and trying to be subtle. He's playing this very elaborate um, uh, sort of messaging game, where I think what he's really trying to communicate to a lot of people around the world is, personally, I'd really rather not get involved in this whole mess in Syria. But here's the one thing that might force my hand. Convince the Syrians not to do this one thing. If they don't do this one thing, you know, we'd rather not do it. Um, but for all sorts of kind of, you know, hopefully obvious reasons, this isn't something you can really say out loud. So it has to be a very um, indirect and subtle kind of signaling. Um, you know, I I don't know how much the um, Obama administration anticipated the degree to which Russia would intervene in Syria. Um, this was before Crimea had happened. You know, before their involvement in Ukraine. Uh, and Russia, for a long time, had been a pretty um, non-capable military power and the degree to which Putin had rebuilt uh, their forces and their capacity to act out of the area um, may not have been clear yet in you know, 2012, 2013. Jeff, great job. Thank you very much. Um, because you did such a good job, I will take credit for recruiting you. <laughs> Had you not, I never met you before. But excellent job, thank you. Um, so just a, a question. One of the sort of logical things that comes out of your talk is that uh, calculations of regime survival will essentially trump everything always. Uh, so given that's the case, uh, the whole sort of deterrence compellence, if regime survival is at stake, that whole framework seems kind of weak sauce to, uh, uh, to make the calculation other than regime survival. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that a fair conclusion? I won't go quite that far. Um, I mean, you know, the, the right, you can see how I rank ordered them, right? The first one is the most important, which is there's a lot of situations where coercion is going to have a real uphill battle and, and the odds are, are against it. And I think Western policymakers, um, to some degree, are in love with coercion. All right? We, on the one hand, uh, have a lot of foreign policy objectives uh, that we care about and that we want to achieve that require uh, projecting influence to other parts of the world. Um, on the other hand, we kind of spread ourselves too thin uh, by a lot. Uh, there's not a whole lot of military power left to kind of throw at problems. So, you know, you don't want to do nothing and you don't want to go to war. You know, coercion is the card that's still left on the table and the temptation is to play it. So a big part of what we're saying is a warning, like, just because this is the option that falls in between doing nothing and going to war doesn't mean it's a good option, right? It might still be a lousy option. Um, but that said, done right, it can still achieve some things. So we're not going to take it 100% off the table. Um, we're just trying to, you know, A, induce a much bigger note of caution about using it, 
uh, and B, give some advice about how to plan it so that if you use it, you're at least doing it in a way that maximizes your chances of success. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for the, your presentation today. If we could show the appreciation.